We asked Forbes contributor Todd Essig, who is also a psychoanalyst, to sit down with Diana Henriquez, the former New York Times finance correspondent, to discuss the letters and emails Bernie Madoff had sent her over the last two years. We wanted to know, is Madoff a monster or is he an everyman? Here's our conversation. Todd, in the course of my correspondence with Bernie Madoff, it was always tempting to do a little armchair psychology and try to figure out what motivates the man, what's really behind all these words uh, that I've been exchanging with him. Uh, well, you're the real thing. You're a real psychologist. What was your impression of this correspondence as you went through it? Bernie Madoff is such a compelling, fascinating figure that he is a magnet for all those kinds of um, psychological theories and attributions about what's going on inside his head. Perhaps no one more so than you because of this email exchange. But it was, it was striking the way that if I paid attention to the music and not the lyrics, the ways in which he was trying to kind of use you for various kind of um, prison type agenda items. Yes. One of which early on in your exchange was about his trying to get you to give him a New York Times subscription. Yes. Because he was bored and wanted to read. Yes. Um, and there were a whole series of emails back and forth um, where he was asking for it. And let me just read something towards the end of this exchange. Um, this is coming from January 2011, um, where he's checking back in with you once again. Right. Why hasn't it arrived? <laughs> By the way, what is the situation with my request for a New York Times subscription? I hate to be a pest. Is there some problem with you or the paper sending it? I know, I know that other inmates get a subscription directly here. It would help me keep abreast of what is going on. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, Diana's response was to point out that journalistic ethics of the New York Times right. precludes purchasing gifts for the people one is interviewing. That's true. I, I, I had explained that to his lawyer and asked his lawyer to pass that along. That clearly didn't work. So finally, trying not to anger him, but still drawing a line in the sand, I said, I can't do that, Bernie. I just can't. So his response to your asserting a very clear, unambiguous ethical guideline. Correct. Was to, was to write back um, a couple of weeks later, um, one of the options that you would discuss was maybe sending it to the library. Yes, I could donate a subscription to the prison library. And his response is, I spoke to the library and it is too complicated a procedure. So back to square one. I can give you the name of another fellow here if that works. <laughs> the idea being clearly, well, don't give it to me then. Give it to this other guy and we'll just pretend. Exactly. Right? It, I mean, so it, it there's was, a way around the ethical guidelines. Exactly. We can work this out. You know, there's, there's a there's a, uh, a plan B we can work out. Um, my, my margin note when I read that was 1962 all over again. Exactly. I will find a way to make this work. I, yes. That, that uh, will accomplish the same unethical end through a way that will technically fit within the ethical guidelines, you won't be giving the subscription to me. You'll be giving it to this other inmate that you haven't interviewed. Uh, so Confusing ethics and honesty with criminality. Yes, and with getting what he wanted. Mm -hmm. I mean, what he wanted was that subscription, which as you know, is extremely expensive. It was far beyond a de minimis gift that I could give him. Um, so that was, that was an interesting exchange. Were there others that uh, Then there was you? another one that was on the other end of the spectrum in that it kind of generates a real sense of the pain that he's caused for himself as well as for the people in his life. Which one were those? This was his um, letter to you um, October 24th, 2011, which was the first note after the Stephanie made off 2020 interview. True. Um, a very moving interview in which she was extremely angry at him mm -hmm. um, and extremely emotional about the loss of her husband, Mark. And, she, and he writes to you, in spite of my being warned and not to watch the interview by my psychologist, I did. Of course it was as painful as expected. I could not find fault with what she said about me or the hate she expressed. Yes. So again, He's told to do one thing by the expert, someone who in other emails, the two of you were clear, has been extremely helpful for him. Yes. And despite that particular um, piece of wisdom, guidance, suggestion, 
Um, as a psychologist, I know that um, people should listen to what we say, but don't. <laughs> um, but and he's not unusual in that. But then, for him, but it's particularly clear yes. that he did the very thing that he was told not to do, knowing it was going to cause him pain. And it did. And it, it clearly did. did cause him pain. One last question. Um, I am constantly asked when I give talks about uh, the Wizard of Lies, well, was he a psychopath? Was he a sociopath? I don't know what to answer. What should I say? I think the only answer to that that's possible is to invoke um, eighth grade algebra and that we have a system of simultaneous equations with many more variables than equations and there's just not enough data.